and uh, sustainability practices. Um, the session will be recorded for future reference. Um, if you'd like to mute your cameras, most of you have, that's fine. Um, and then as we go through the session today, if you have questions, you can either use the raise hand function or I will also be monitoring the chat. You can put your questions in the chat. Um, I would like to turn things over to our representatives from the city, Julaine Potter, Kevin Boyland, and Ben Huffing. Um, I will let them talk a little bit more about their particular areas of interest, but uh, we will go ahead and turn it over to them. Uh, thank you very much, the three of you, for being here, and it's all yours. Thanks. Thank you, Julian. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, good to see folks here this morning. Uh, my name is Kevin Boylan, and I am the City of Beaverton's Climate, uh, sorry, Sustainability Analyst, where I work on the uh, implementation of the City's Climate Action Plan. So food waste uh, fits into that quite nicely, so we're going to look at that this morning. Awesome. And hi, everyone. I'm Ben Hoffein. I'm the City of Beaverton's Business Recycling Outreach Specialist. Um, and I also help Julaine and assist her in a lot of the things she does with food scraps. Um, but my main role is helping businesses with waste reduction and recycling. All right, so I think I'm just going to take it away and I'm going to share my screen. Um, and if anyone does have any questions or uses the raise hand feature, um, Julaine or Rob or someone, if you can just kind of interrupt me and let me know because I can't quite see all the chat and everything well. Yep, well, got it for sure. We'll do, Kevin. So, much. Um, so yep, perfect. Can you all see the screen? Yep. yep, looks good. Yeah, we passed. Not the one with my notes, right? <laughs> all right. So, um, like I said, um, this morning, I'm going to give an overview of the, the city's climate action plan, but more specifically, how food systems and uh, food waste prevention play a role in meeting the city's climate action goals. So we've titled this this morning, um, Food, Waste and Recycling, the Climate Connection to Businesses. Um, and then we're going to look at a few specific actions from the plan related to food. And then um, following that, Julian's going to go into some specifics on, on resources and assistance for businesses. Um, so first, we're just going to start off very broadly with the role of food loss and waste and how that plays into greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so this picture here on this title slide that you see, um, it's not really about food waste, right? Um, it's not from Beaverton, it's not from Oregon, it's not even from the US. Um, it's a building that's in Milan, Italy. I, I chose it because I think it's a, a cool visual reminder of what's possible to accomplish through collaboration and coordination. It's, uh, it's not like an easy feat to hang a tree off of a, a 20 story building, or then to just go a step further and say, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna cover the whole building. Um, but here we are, we see that it's completely possible in the picture. Um, so it's a stand in for all of these things, these hurdles and these status quo approaches that we'll have to overcome as we address the climate crisis. Uh, people saying you can't do that because it's not in code or, or businesses will hate it or it's uninsurable or the folks living there won't adjust or there's too many maintenance costs. Um, all of these things can be overcome. So Milan, coincidentally, also happens to be one of the cities leading the way on tackling uh, food waste issues at the urban level. They've developed an Urban Food Policy Act, which is pretty cool, and I'll share the link after the presentation. And they've also successfully established these food waste hubs that collect produce from supermarkets and businesses, as well as uh, food that folks purchase and donate uh, to give to local families in need. So it makes them just one of the, the many peers that we can learn from on this, this journey. 
So here's two more pictures. Um, if we were in the room, we'd ask for a show of hands, right, um, of which one folks think causes more greenhouse gas emissions. Because of the topic today, I think we already know the answer. Um, but it's kind of like a lot when you see it on the screen, right, the comparison that food waste in the United States results in more greenhouse gas emissions than the airline industry, which is a lot of wasted food. And at the same time, um, in the census that was recently conducted, uh, 30 million Americans reported that they didn't have enough to eat the previous week. So all of that wasted food and all of those people in need and all of those emissions, right, that stacks up to this urgent call for action. And the scale of the whole thing is really kind of tough to wrap your head around. Um, one third of all of the world's food is never eaten. And all of that food represents a lot of embodied carbon. So you have all of these, these fields plowed for no reason, um, synthesizer, uh, synthesizer, fertilizer synthesized for, for no reason, um, water pumped, goods and labor transported all around, energy, um, used all throughout this process, all for naught, for all this food that just winds up in the bin at the end of the day. So all of this kind of squandering of resources, right, generates a bunch of greenhouse gas emissions all along the supply chain. Um, and, then, and then that food goes to waste. Um, and that includes right up to when it decomposes in the landfill and continues to release more emissions. All of this means that the food that we waste is responsible for roughly 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, in the US alone, the production of loss or wasted food generates the equivalent of 33 million cars worth of emissions, um, which again is like a really abstract number, right? 33 million. Um, but just to put it into comparison, um, there's 15 million registered cars in the state of California, the largest state. So double all of the cars in California, and then all of the registered cars in the state of Oregon, and then you have around 33 million cars. Um, it seems like you can't uh, pick up your phone, uh, right? That's where we all read the paper now. You can't say pick up the paper. <laughs> um, you can't pick up your phone without you know, hearing about EVs and how they're going to cut all of these emissions and everything. And yeah, they will. That's great. Um, but with this, this is we're talking about taking 33 million cars off the road just from doing something we should be doing anyway, right? Which is wasting less and disposing of things properly. Um, and that's what we're trying to do is cut emissions, right? So that's the way we limit the impacts is by reducing the emissions. And the best way to kind of get somewhere is to set a goal. So that's what the world did. And they came up with this 1.5 degrees Celsius goal, which is the goal to limit global average temperature increases. Um, and it's abstract and everything, it's in Celsius, it makes it hard to think about it's on a global scale. So it's, it's hard for it to carry a lot of weight as a statistic, right? It's just easy to glance over. I saw this other statistic the other day that was, 375 weeks. Um, and that's how long we have to have emissions in the hopes of actually meeting that global goal, right? And avoiding the worst. And I say avoiding the worst because, you know, things aren't really going that great already. Um, we've, we've seen that there is this urgent need to act immediately and on all levels. And tackling food waste is so appealing on that because it hits so many of these different levels. It doesn't require any sort of futuristic technology and it's something that we can, we can all do and will have a really big impact. So last year, um, the EPA released a report on the environmental impacts of US food waste and loss. Um, and it's got some pretty wild statistics in it. Um, I'm just going to run through them right here. 24% um, of landfill municipal solid waste is food waste. Um, all of that, that waste is enough blue water uh, for the annual use of 50 million American homes. 
It's also enough energy to power 50 million American homes for one year and has the equivalent CO2 emissions of 42 coal, coal fired power plants um, and enough calories to feed more than 150 million people a year. That's, that's pretty, uh, you know, startling. Um, if we were just running around, <laughs> if we were just running 42 coal fired power plants for no reason, um, that would like turn some heads. But in this case, it's a little here and a little there, and it's not coal, it's fruit and milk. Um, so it can't be that bad, right? But it turns out it's, it's really bad. Um, and this emissions number here doesn't even include those methane emissions from the landfill. So basically what, what all of these stats add up to is that even if we halted fossil fuel emissions, um, current trends in the food system, because the food system is so large, would prevent the achievement of that 1.5 degrees Celsius goal that we talked about a minute ago, which is really kind of uncomfortable to hear because um, we're, we're doing so much work to try to meet these emissions goals. Um, and in this case, we're talking about food, which is something, you know, it's like embedded in all of our behaviors. So it makes it, it, makes it difficult. Um, between the lines, all these stats also point out that there's so many other parts of the food system that are key to um, addressing the climate crisis from, from water use to energy use um, to equity and food security. Um, the report also noted that the bulk of environmental benefits could be achieved by having food waste in just three sectors, and those are households, restaurants, and food processing, and that by focusing on the most resource intensive foods like animal products and fruits and vegetables, that can yield the greatest environmental benefit. So that's a link to the, to the report too, um, which I'll share at the end of the presentation as well. Um, that was kind of a, a bunch of statistics at, at the, the national scale, right? Or the global scale in the beginning. I wanted to zoom in a bit and look at where emissions in Beaverton originate. Um, and unfortunately it's not quite as simple as it sounds. Um, the accounting all depends on how you count. <laughs> Um, we could simplify things and say that 38% of emissions come from uh, transportation uh, and 30% from commercial energy use and 28% from residential energy use. And that's all true, but today we're talking about food. So counting like that um, doesn't tell the whole picture. Um, it's not a bad picture, it's just not a crisp one because food cuts across all of those categories. So its emissions are dispersed throughout. So this is a complicated graphic that is just kind of for reference. You don't have to digest it all. Um, it's just to, to get at the point that nearly all food has emissions before and after its involvement with Beaverton. Um, and it's our consumption behaviors that drive those emissions. So if, if if all of Beaverton decides not to consume something, that's going to make a difference. Let's say um, everyone in Beaverton decided that they were not going to consume coffee anymore <laughs> um, or bananas, right? All of those um, emissions or, or lack of emissions from those products should be accounted for. And, and similarly, if everyone in Beaverton decided or committed to um, that they weren't going to landfill all of those bananas that went bad on their counter every week, um, that should be counted also. So this graphic here just shows how that, that type of consumption behaviors um, play into the state of Oregon's emissions. Um, so you could just think of this graphic on a smaller scale for Beaverton. I apologize that we don't have a city specific one, um, but maybe someday. So the point of all of this, is that a big chunk of those emissions in Beaverton come from the consumption of things. Um, sometimes things are produced here, um, but a lot of times they're produced elsewhere on the right-hand side of this graphic, and then they're imported to Beaverton. But those are still Beaverton's emissions, right? And our behaviors are responsible for them. And what this means is that individual choices and behaviors overwhelmingly influence 
um, consumption-based emissions globally. And this is particularly apparent with food, which is why we, we went into this detail for this, this explanation. So in recognition of Beaverton's contributions to climate change, both as a community and as a municipal government, um, the city set out to develop a climate action plan. Um, and this was along with the growing recognition of the position that both cities and businesses are in to lead on climate action. Cities account for more than half the world's population, and they also contribute 70% of global carbon emissions. So they're a great place to start. Um, the city started the development of its climate action plan in 2016, and then it was adopted by city council in late 2019. So if you haven't had a chance to look at it, you can find it at beavertonoregon.gov slash sustainability. And I'd encourage you all to, to have a peek. The plan, um, we're just gonna go into a little overview of the plan here. It has two overarching goals. Um, one of them is community-wide, um, and that's a 2050 goal of 100% reduction of community greenhouse gas emissions um, community-wide from a 2013 baseline, which comes out to be 3% annually. Um, and the other goal is, is more focused on city operations. Um, and that's a 2030 goal of carbon neutral city operations. Both of these are in line with the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal mentioned earlier. But neither of them can really be achieved in isolation and they require the support innovation and persistence of uh, partners, businesses, and residents. Um, it's essential that we meet them or things will be pretty different in the future. The entire uh, BCAP, that's the Beaverton Climate Action Plan. So the entire BCAP framework includes 86 actions and they're distributed across five categories seen here. Consumer choice and waste, buildings, energy, and urban form, transportation, natural systems, and community well-being. So food waste might not be, you know, explicitly called out in each of these chapters, but the connections to food and food waste are, are unavoidable in each of them. So just to kind of name a few, the consumer choice and waste chapter, that one's pretty self-explanatory given the title of it. It ties a lot to consumption and disposal of, of products, including food. Um, the buildings, energy, and urban form category, buildings are where food is, uh, is stored, where it's prepared, where it's eaten. So there's lines that can be drawn there to um, energy use around refrigeration, um, energy efficiency, and things like that. And then we have the, the transportation chapter, which Unless you're growing your food in your backyard, it's all coming from somewhere. Um, we're moving it and the people who prepare it and serve it and, and the folks who, who eat it um, all around town, right? So there's emissions related there. In the natural systems chapter, um, here we see an overlap with land use and water use. Moving water from place to place is um, very energy intensive, so it can result in a lot of emissions. And then we have the community well being chapter where we can tie to uh, adaptive actions um, and health and resiliency, food security, things like that. So more specifically, um, food is called out at, at several points in the plan. Um, so I'm just gonna run through them uh, pretty quickly here. The first is um, an action that calls for expanding participation in residential food scraps programs. This is an action that includes education and outreach around food scrap collection um, through the uh, food waste collection bins and future efforts perhaps to address food scraps collection at multifamily properties, um, which would also include outreach resources and technical assistance to property managers and residents. And next is an action that calls for reducing residential and business wasted food um, this occurs through promotion of various campaigns, such as the Eat Smart Waste Less campaign, and um, now we have DEQ's Don't Let food, Good Food Go Bad campaign, along with um, other capacity building resources for businesses um, as part of the, the Food Waste Stops With Me initiative. 
Another action in the plan calls for increasing business participation uh, in food donation and food scrap selection. So this includes working with local businesses to help set them up for compliance in the upcoming mandatory food scrap separation requirements, which Tulane is going to dive into in a minute. Um, and then another action is prioritizing the recovery of items with high environmental impact. This action is kind of broad and overlapping, but I mention it here um, specifically because these efforts to focus on food and it's reflective of the high impact of food waste on emissions. And then finally, this last one down here from the community um, well-being chapter is expanding local food security and emergency distribution plans, prioritizing the needs of vulnerable populations. And this is less focused on emissions reduction and uh, much more on, on an adaptive scale and resiliency action um, that currently occurs by, by working closely with organizations to increase food donation. So that's how food shows up in, in the BCAP. And what all of that boils down to is that reducing waste via responsible consumption, keeping food scraps out of the landfill, and ensuring the food that is produced makes it into the hands of those who need it, right? So we have less wasted or lost food equaling less emissions, diverting food waste from the landfill, which equals less uncontrolled decomposition. And so again, less emissions, and then using food that would have been wasted uh, for those in need, making the emissions associated with that food uh, worth it, right? because they were released along the way. So finally, just to wrap up, um, we keep coming back to how big a piece food is in this puzzle. Um, and that's really because of how ever present it is in our lives. Not all of us will, will drive somewhere today. Um, not all of us will turn on a stove or the heat in our house, um, but we're all going to eat something. And so that makes food this, this huge part of our lives um, as a household, as a community, and, and as a society. And because of that, it has this outsized impact on everything it relates to, uh, culture, economics, health, the environment, and particularly the climate. And that's because all of this food, before it comes to us, as we talked about, or before it comes to a kitchen somewhere or a restaurant somewhere, it all comes from somewhere else. Um, it could be down the road somewhere um, in Oregon. It could be a cattle lot in Texas or, you know, bananas from Ecuador. All of that has impact. And the more of it that we waste, the more unnecessary production is supported and the more emissions we create. And so just kind of around and around we go in this cycle. By wasting less and diverting more of what we do waste from the landfill, we have an opportunity to kind of cut this cycle and to break it and possibly, you know, through diversion and composting and whatnot, create a better cycle. So the good news in all of this is that food is everywhere. Um, and because of that scale, there's an opportunity, right? Since it's all around us, we, we have the chance to modify some of that behavior as individuals, um, as businesses, and as organizations, all of us are involved in food in some way. So we have the opportunity multiple times a day to make those changes and help create a better, a better system. So that's my broad overview. Um, at this point, I think I'm gonna hand it over to Julaine. Um, and then at the end, we can do some questions unless there's any questions right now. Yeah, I don't see any questions right now. So thank you very much, Kevin. And Julian, go ahead.
Julian, I have a question for you. So we have several of our, our clients that are run childcare businesses, daycare centers, and wondering if they fit in the, most of them would fit in the small business category or are they not on the list of being regulated? Very good, thank you.
Great. Let's uh, go ahead and open up for questions. Um, I don't know if anybody has a question you'd like to pose to Julaine or any of the other members of the city about what they presented or any other things related to climate change, food scrap waste, recycling, or other issues that are um, on your mind, please. Um, so my name is Gloria. Thank you for this for this information. That's really important. I'd like to know if, as um, childcare providers, where can we get those stickers or those um, containers uh, so that we can have them for early education programs for recycling and for food waste? And another question I have is, I think you were saying that that as businesses we can get food services and like where we can use them in the gardens right like we can get that stuff for our gardens that right i apologize i um i did not catch the first part of that because i didn't have my translation on i'm so sorry i just heard the last part about compost for the gardens um i think i think i can answer julaine oh uh, great perfect thanks ben so in terms of getting uh resources from us you can either come in directly, though I would I would uh, suggest that you email one of us, um, and we will be able to, once we get your address um, and your contact info, be able to bring the resources to you, um, and we can talk further over email. And um, we I don't think we have we don't have a slide for the pamphlet of the resources that we have, um, but that is something that we can easily do over email um, for resources. Did that, I, did I answer all the questions, the, the full question? I may have missed something. Second half of the question I think was um, supplies are being able to use some of the, I, I, I think it was about the compost. I don't know, maybe we could elaborate on the question a little bit. Um, Oh, uh, what type of containers do you, do we need or that you have so that people can collect food where it goes to, you know, so it can decompose so that it can turn into fertilizer because it, um, we know we're small businesses as uh, childcare uh, businesses. So we create a lot of garbage throughout the week. So where can we get those types of, of containers? Um, so if you are wanting a container to grab to put in your yard debris cart, take away to a facility, we have different options. We have a countertop uh, container. Um, I don't have here that's for households and, that, and then we have the green, the bucket, and then the tall one that we're shown on the slide. If you're referring to a container that you can create compost in your garden, we don't supply those, but I can direct you to where you can find them. Okay, very thank good. you very much. And the best way to reach you, Julian, or get just, just to the email that's on the screen, mm -hmm. probably the best way to get a hold of you. Perfect. Yeah, definitely. Does anyone have other questions for our folks from the city on, on recycling, on food waste, on climate change or climate change plan for the city? I have some questions and some, some suggestions because you were saying, what are the fossil foods and why are, you know, 
Um, you're talking about um, equity and and equality, you know. But why aren't you giving these, um, you know, resources to micro and small businesses? As uh, teacher Gloria mentioned, you know, you know, we're in low income communities. I'm in the part of the I'm part of the low income community, and I understand that what you're saying. But you don't teach us or show us how to do this work, how to do you know, the process to plant or to recycle. We'll just continue to be con to consume, like Kevin was saying, we're just gonna keep doing that. So we have to educate ourselves and we have to be disciplined, but first of all, you have to show us what to do. So, so if you could come down to our community, you know, and talk to us one-on-one, like Maestra Gloria was saying, you know, you know, we're a small teacher, you know, but little by little, we can come together and we can achieve that goal once we all do it together. The solid food, uh, food that Julian was mentioning, it has to be all solids, right? Sometimes um, we throw out beans because the beans, they could co coagulate and make themselves, you know, solid later. So they tell us that we can't put them in there, but they can coagulate. Um, I also think that um, with, for example, I'm a, a healthcare worker volunteer at St. Vincent Hospital. And, um, you know, and so this has to do with, with, this is a very important topic that has to do with not with just our health, but with everyone's health. Why don't you go to organizations like that, the promotores or the healthcare workers to create alliances um, to give educational programs? Because, you know, we're talking about equality, equity, justice, but really, you know, you know, we're the ones that are going to be impacted. And so I would like, as a, a, I'd like to suggest that you offer some a curriculum or some workshops, I don't know what you would call it, for early education to generate resources that would create education for the children. You know, you know, why are, why are we attacking it on a organizational or large business uh, at level when we really have to go lower and start in education. And I also like for these presentations are, uh, to give us some more statistics, statistics like Kevin was talking about, you know, how you, you know, you know, Julian was talking about how, you know, how long you've been doing this program, like you were saying, like, how long have you been doing this program, the before, during and after we just need more information. So thank you for that. Sorry, I, I can pass the, like let other people talk now. Oh, thank you so much. So many um, great suggestions. And um, what was your name again? Leticia. Leticia. Thank you so much, Leticia. So um, first of all, education is absolutely so crucial and important. And um, we would be happy to come and talk to um, any groups or businesses. Um, there, so Metro has um, a, a department, they actually have folks that do education in our K through 12 schools, um, as well as other um, various opportunities for them to come out and present. Um, but we're happy to do that as well. And we want to do that. And you're right, that's kind of what we're looking at. The focus of our programs have really been on larger businesses because larger businesses make more of an environmental impact. <clears throat> but we're starting to really recognize that everybody makes an impact and the issues with climate change uh, impact uh, our, our BIPOC communities even more. And um, so we really need to have everybody um, included in the conversation. And um, so please reach out to me. I would love to talk to you not only about providing education, but also connecting with the healthcare workers. Because um, yes, again, you know, food is, um, it's, it's crucial for health and vitality in our communities. And there, and there's, there are other things happening in the county that I think, you know, it would be great to, um, to talk to you about that. This is y, great feedback. Go ahead. Sí, sí. Y Jose tienes una pregunta. Jose has his hand raised. Yeah. Um, my name is Jose David Hernandez. I 
and I have a, a cleaning business. It's a small business. And I would also like, um, well, to um, make a proposal. So unfortunately, their papers or cartons that said that this is compostable or it's not compostable. And you, so then when we go, they say, oh, um, you have to separate everything that's compostable. But, you know, people don't do that. So I think that, you know, you maybe could give us a little bit more detailed explanation about how, you know, if it's just for, you know, or coffee waste or green food waste or, you know, with fatty food waste, because a lot of times, um, you know, you know, I, that I run into problems with that. So I have a business, but I work with someone who um, is a, a blueberry farmer and vegetable farmer. So they have fruit trees. So we work on all that. And we see that a lot of organizations or companies uh, bring things out to compost, but a lot of them don't because it doesn't work um, because it has fats or grease. So that's just something I'd like to learn more about. If you could explain a little bit more, give a more detailed explanation, like what can you recycle and what can you not mix with compostables? Yeah, um, it's a great questions. And I, I just wanted to do a time check. Um, do we have until 10 or... Yeah, we have until 10 o'clock. Yeah. Okay. So uh, these are such good questions. And I just, I would love um, to be invited back. Um, and I have some other colleagues that work specifically on our residential and, um, and multifamily programs too. And we could come back and do a, a presentation on kind of the broader program um, and, uh, and also get into more details in, on the recycling program. Um, cause that is a little more complicated of what goes in and what doesn't. Um, but just to briefly, um, touch on the issue of fats and liquids. Um, I think that, you know, the beans would be okay. Um, it's, they just, you know, they don't want you pouring a whole bunch of milk in there and they don't want a whole bunch of grease going in there, but if it's a food product that has some liquids in it, that's okay. Or if you have a small amount of, um, something, you know, dressing that will go in and be mixed with other things. Um, and then, you know, as far as grease goes, that, that is an issue. There are companies that can come and pick that up. They're rendering companies. They come and pick up meats and grease greases from restaurants and grocery stores. Um, so that's something that you could look into. Um, again, Jose, please feel free to uh, reach out um, and we can talk about uh, specifics and also our website does have a lot of really good information on what is recyclable and what isn't. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you, Julaine. We have time folks for one or two more questions. Does someone else have another question? Uh, yeah, good morning. I'm Norma Torres. I'm listening to the questions and uh, the information that you gave us really is is really good. It's really interesting. It's really important. And um, yeah, definitely. I agree with the people who were saying uh, that, that, you know, working more on this aspect, you know, this um, commitment to know how to work with with trash um it's a it's a really important topic and uh you know we also you know process so many animals and and we just don't take care when it comes to that so right now um so this is you know hearing about this topic i really do think that you know I wrote my comment down uh, that, you know, we don't have a lot of uh, dissemination of this information, even just at homes, residential places with, with um, you know, especially talking with our children, it's important, but it's also important for adults. Um, 
you know, sometimes we just don't have knowledge about all of this. So I would just ask that to spe that you specifically work to reach more families, more households, and so that they can make that real commitment and so that they know how to recycle their trash well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your comments and questions. We have time for one more question if anyone has one more question or comment you would like to make. Okay, so I don't see another question. Um, I would like to thank very much Julaine and Ben and Kevin for joining us from the city and sharing information and answering everybody's questions. Um, I think we all recognize how important this is and um, how much um, just individually we can contribute to reducing our food waste and, and better commitment to recycling. Um, we will look to maybe have a follow-up session sometime in the future with more details. And again, we encourage you, if you have questions, to contact um, the folks at the city um, at, the at the email that was provided, or if you reach out to us, myself or Gustavo, at Impact Beaverton at the Beaverton Area Chamber of Commerce, we'd be happy to put you in contact with the folks at the city. We work closely with them on a number of programs. Um, and then next week, we have a session on Tuesday morning at nine o'clock on building healthy credit um, for a lady named uh, Yunan Tuvares from Community Lending Works. We'll be talking about how you can go about building healthy credit for yourself and for your business. Um, if you have other questions or any other follow up, please contact Gustavo or I. We would be happy to help you. And again, we'd like to thank Jessica Dover for doing our translation today. And once again, thank you, Julaine. Thank you, Ben. And thank you, Kevin, for joining us. We appreciate your time and we appreciate your insights. And we really appreciate all the work that the city of Beaverton is doing to uh, help make our, our, our city and our planet more sustainable. Thank you so much for all your thank time. You. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You all. Thank you all. Bye-bye.